Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, lecture three of COM 372. And just a reminder, it's my hope that you will use all of these resources in a non-synchronous way to really learn uh, this skill set. So you've got my lectures, you've got the um, LinkedIn learning um, lectures, which are from uh, real video editing experts. My area of expertise is more in uh, film history, film production, so, you know, I can defer to the really high end professional editors for some of this knowledge and it's really helpful. And then, of course, the textbooks as well. And so this path that you're on this semester, really, if you use all three of these well, I have no doubt that you all will be uh, really skilled video editors by the end of this uh, 15 week journey. So please make sure that you're keeping up with all of these things, then use the live synchronous class time to ask for clarity, ask any questions, uh, that sort of thing. So I'm picking up with lecture three about uh, the Adobe Premiere Pro uh, workspace. And what I've got is a more current uh, screenshot of the Adobe Premiere Pro editing interface. And a couple things to notice here. Again, it's very complex when you look at this and don't understand what your um, what you're seeing. But I will remind you again, the workflow are, is really three vectors in the shape of the letter N, the vector that moves up and then across and then back up. And you start with raw material in your bin. You look at your preview window, you look at your edit timeline, and then you look at your uh, programming window. And this relates in a lot of ways, I talked yesterday about film history, it relates in a lot of ways to television history because certainly you'll have in a uh, television control room, that's an area where I am uh, an expert having produced, you know, close to a thousand shows in my uh, career. Um, in a television control room, you always have a preview monitor and a program monitor. So you see what the audience is seeing in this monitor and you see what's next up here. It's a way of helping to control that massive workflow. So even if you have, say, a 20 camera shoot, if you're doing a live broadcast, an NFL game, um, a really big news event, lots of cameras, some on jib arms, wide shots, two shots, tight, uh, you know, all that stuff in, in, in uh, a control room environment, you still have the preview and program window and then you'll often have another 15 windows that have other elements, the raw graphics, the on-screen text that you're going to add, um, the cameras that aren't being used. And so you'll see a director um, calling all of these different cameras to put them into the preview window so that that camera person, men and, men and, men and women both do this job, um, the camera person will, uh, will be ready to be on air. So you preview it and then you take it. And that's how everybody knows that this camera, camera 15, the wide shot of the football field is about to be the air next. And by using that system, nobody makes the mistake of doing a, a stupid looking move well on air. It's how you avoid a non-professional broadcast. So anyway, so that interface has been recreated in the editing system. And as I said yesterday, it's not a film thing because film was always the, the steam back, the cutting of the film, the putting the clips up in the air, and then bringing them down one piece at a time, taping it together. Very tactile, very much like a craft, whereas this is much more of an interface with a technology. So anyway, so what we have here, and I'll start I'll start from um, uh, the uh, project panel, which is this box here. When you open Premiere Pro, this will be the box that's highlighted because that's where you tell Premiere what you wanna do. You wanna bring in your raw material, you wanna bring in your, um, your output from Audition or from After Effects. This is where you gather your uh, materials and you have the option of looking at the list view, which is what's in this, uh, picture that I grabbed, or looking at the uh, clip view where you can actually do editing inside of this bin. If you um, switch over to um, seeing all of the video clips side by side, you can actually put an in and an out point here in this, uh, in this bin. So super useful. And you can actually, for example, on your stop motion film, you can take all of your individual photographs, which are 
hopefully done in order because if they're not, you're going to have to do a lot more work in editing. But hopefully you do your stop motion film in chronological order. If you do, you can grab all of those photographs and you can bring them all over each two frames or four frames, depending on what your tastes are. And you can bring them over and drop them into your timeline and they will be dropped in chronological order. So if you shoot the film in order, you will have a huge head start in editing because all of those photographs will be here in chronological order. Now you may have to fix things, you may have to adjust. It's not a foolproof system, but it is a massive time saver where you can save hours of work just by shooting your stop motion in order and then taking all of those command A, control A, dragging them all over at the same time, dropping them in, and it will drop them into the timeline in order. Okay, so this is your project panel. And um, this is the timeline panel. And the timeline works on a system called time code, which gives an individual number to every single frame in the film or in the movie, whatever, video project. And that individual number correlates exactly with that frame. And so if you tell an editor that you're working with, okay, I want to adjust the audio at one hour, 13 minutes, 42 seconds, and five frames, they can find that exact moment that you want to make your adjustment. And so time code becomes the way that we communicate with each other across a uh, digital pro uh, project. So uh, every week I'm producing a show for my station and every week now, especially in COVID, I'm working from here in this room and my editor is working from his house, uh, uh, you know, out in the uh, DMV area and we're having to communicate and we communicate using time code. So the time code starts here on this far edge at 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and each number correlates to hour number or tape number, shoot number, then um, minutes, then seconds, and then frames. And you can decide what frame rate you're going to use. Are you going to use 24 frames a second, which is the traditional film standard, again, from the analog film era. Very early in the analog film era, it was first thought that 18 frames a second was the, was the right uh, amount of, um, of uh, information, media. And it's cheaper to do 18 frames a second in the analog era than it is to do 24. You use a lot less film stock. You, know, you use basically 75% of the film stock. So your films become 75% cheaper, sorry, 25% cheaper to both shoot and um, process, right? And there's, so there's a lot less raw material when it's 18 frames a second. But filmmakers decided, you know, in the 1920s that it would just wasn't enough material to keep the film from looking choppy. Um, they thought that, that uh, there just was a little bit, uh, it was a little bit rough and there was not enough persistence of vision for 18 frames a second. And so 24 became the standard in filmmaking. In a different lecture, I'll talk about why television settled on 30. So television is 30 frames a second. And I'll talk about interlaced versus progressive. That's a different lecture. Um, but, uh, but that number, 24 frames per second, is an old film standard. And so many people who want to consider themselves to be filmmakers will work in 24 uh, progressive because they think that it feels more like authentic analog film. Uh, 30 frames per second, as I said, is, is uh, usually a TV number. It's usually a digital media number. I think they're kind of insignificant at this point because we're not talking about massive savings of resources. We're not talking about uh, you know, something that costs way more to, to process in the analog film era. So now it's a question of aesthetic choices and taste. When I'm working on a film, I do it at 24. When I'm working on a video or a digital project, I do it at 30. It's just the choice that I make and a choice, that same choice is made by a lot of filmmakers uh, through this process. Okay, so I want to talk for a second about all of these lines in this edit timeline. And if you look, you can see a line that is v, uh, V3 here 
That's that top line going all the way across, a line that is V2, and each of these icons is part of that line. So here's V2 with one clip in it, one video clip. And then here's V1, video one, with all of the rest of the video. Now the way that video works in Adobe is that it selects the top piece of video in any frame and it shows that piece of video. So it's going to show that piece here, but in this one it's going to show this piece and none of this unless you change the opacity of the uh, top layer. So if you say if you made the top layer 50%, and the bottom layer 100%, then you would have a superimposition, one image on top of the other. That's how crossfade works, a cross dissolve. Um, that's how you can build a really neat layered graphic. It's also how um, uh, the ultra key works. And we're gonna, we're gonna work on that later in the semester when we're doing green screen. Uh, the ultra key works by putting the keyed green element on the top telling the system that everything that's green goes invisible and then it shows the bottom layer under that green shot. And so that's that phenomenon at work here. So video two will only show in that clip and video one will show in this example everywhere else. So V1, V2, V3. Now right at this center line, we start counting down with audio, A1, A2, A3. Audio is totally different. Audio, it, it plays every bit of audio. And you guys that are probably uh, as frustrated as I am by contemporary audio problems in the cinema where you can't hear the characters talking, um, that's due to this phenomenon or this tradition in audio where every single clip that's in this audio track is played at the level that it's set to. So in the case of this first moment, there is audio in, uh, an audio file there, but I don't see a waveform. I'll talk more about that later if it's confusing you. I don't see a waveform here. So that's telling me as a producer that I'm gonna have uh, video over silent audio. There's a clip there, but there's nothing in it. Now, when I come to the second one, I see a1 and V1 have audio, uh, video and audio, and then A2 and V2 have video and audio. But the only place where I'm seeing audio information here is in A2, right? And you can see that in that little squiggly line there, which is called a waveform. And that waveform is fundamentally important for us as uh, media producers. And so we're gonna spend a lot of time this whole academic year thinking about waveforms, what they say to us, how they work, how they're adjusted. And um, you, you deal with this from the field where you're trying to get clean audio all the way until the very end of your production process where you're trying to get appropriately mixed audio. And you think about the waveform uh, the whole time. It's a little tiny bit of almost indecipherable information to those of you that have never done it before. Uh, is is going to be very important to you um, as you uh, as you work through. Okay, so this lecture is taking a little bit longer than I hoped. I'm going to try to be done in about three minutes. I want to just show to you your tools panel, which is this. The most important tools here, I think, for a beginning producer, is the cursor, which helps you highlight an individual clip. The razor blade, which will help you cut through pieces and then delete stuff that you don't want there. And the pin nib here, which is how you adjust um, audio levels up and down. Not the gain, which is audio coming in, but the volume, which is audio going out. And this little pin nib here in the audio tracks helps you to mix between spoken dialogue, music, sound effects, so that you get an appropriate mix of audio uh, tracks in there. Okay, so our source monitor has a couple of very useful tools. You can see here, for example, in the source monitor, the in point or the letter I gets that as well, and the out point. And that is how you can pick a clip to bring from your source monitor into your timeline or into your movie. So the in and the out point are vitally important. And then you've got two little icons here that are really useful. 
this is the video only icon and this is the audio only icon. So if you want to bring something into your film that's just vi uh, audio, like say you have the sound of an explosion, you want to keep that sound, but you don't want the shot or you have, say, uh, you're working from a two shot and you have the sound of an actor talking, but you don't want to bring in the picture of that actor in close up, you can bring just the audio with this tool and just the video with this tool. So those are the four most important tools for beginning producers in this panel. Those two and those two, in and out, um, video, audio. Now, if you want both, you simply click in the center of this image anywhere and, gr and drag it into the timeline and it will bring that clip from your endpoint and your outpoint, audio and video sync together into those timelines, into the timeline, and it'll be locked together until you unlock it. So it comes in in sync, it stays in sync uh, through your edit until you say, move these out of sync, delete the audio, that sort of thing. We have the playhead here, uh, which in the old days was called a, a tape head uh, because we used to, to cut using tape. And wherever that playhead is, you'll see the time code for that exact moment there. And then in the program monitor, you'll see exactly what's on screen at that exact moment. So this correlates with this space. And um, you can still do things in this, uh, in your movie from here as well. Like for example, you can set an in and out point, you can remove material using these tools here. So you can do some editing after you've made your initial decisions in your source monitor. Okay, a couple more things before I finish this lecture. Notice here, these are all of the um, Adobe presets that move you into different menus and different configurations for the editor. I think you should always work as a default in the editing preset, just because it's the easiest to navigate. If, for example, you get stuck in effects, you're going to lose some of these tools that you need. Now, if you're doing an effect, you want to go over to effects and do that work and go back. It will automatically save your full interface. You won't have to worry about uh, losing something. But where this menu becomes most effective is when you're doing color grading. It will bring up your whole Lumetri color um, uh, toolkit, which is amazing. It's as if they took all of Photoshop and con condensed it into that tab for uh, video. So if you guys know Photoshop at all, and if you don't know Photoshop, you certainly know from having um, manipulated images on your phones um, that uh, these tools are pretty standard across uh, digital media. So things like um, RGB um, uh, curves that you could manipulate midtones and highlights and shadows, um, that's standard, that's normal across all digital uh, media. And the other, the other great tab, then I'll finish up this lecture, is the audio tab. And that allows you to do all kinds of work, really simple, easy presets. For example, you can do a quick noise reduction, you can do a quick enhancement of dialogue for either a male or female voice. And that stuff is all available just by clicking on this effects tab. So that is the interface. The last thing that I have to talk about is the audio meters. And I will just say, finally, make sure that all of your audio is peaking at minus six decibels. Minus six, uh, really between minus 12 and minus six, somewhere in that range. You never want your audio to peak in the red, never, it'll distort. And you don't want your audio peaking so low that the audience can't hear it. So on these meters, you wanna see all audio in this range right here basically green to yellow. Yellow is uh, the target in, uh, in this case. So that's the lecture about the um, Adobe Premiere Pro interface. Please again, watch the videos um, that are provided by uh, LinkedIn Learning. They're really great. They get more specific even into all of these details. And I will have more lectures coming up uh, uh, non-synchronous and then in class as well. See you in the next one.